Today's speaker is Professor Russ Greiner. He is a professor in the Computing Science Department at U of Alberta. Uh, he, is, uh, <clears throat> he was elected a fellow of the AAAI, has been awarded a Mactala professorship and a Killian uh, annual professorship in 2021. Uh, and in 2021, he received the CAIAC Lifetime Achievement Award and became a CIFR AI chair. He has published over 300 refereed papers, most in the areas of machine learning and recently in medical informatics. The main foci of his current work are bio and medical informatics, learning and using effective probabilistic models and formal foundations for of uh, learnability. So uh, he will uh, talk about learning models that predict objective actionable labels. So Russ, the floor is yours. Thank you. Introduction and thank you all for coming. I appreciate you all being here. So, exactly as, as Raj said, I'm going to talk about motivating the challenge of learning objective, actionable labels. So, let me start by giving a bit of context of the last, uh, I've worked in machine learning for about 40 years. The last 20 years, I've been doing lots of work that, that involves animation, <clears throat> lots of work that involves medical applications with many world-class colleagues, many, many clinicians who do very interesting work. And what's interesting is <clears throat> I realized that, that many of them have comments like, they want a tool that, that will do what I do, but do it better. So a lot of this talk is trying to understand what that phrase means and how you can possibly go about doing what they did in a way that's better. <clears throat> so let me give a little context. Uh, can we go back? Uh, uh, many years, 40 years back, and way back machine, to when I was growing up, when expert systems were being used. And here the model was, here's a patient, does he have depression? Here's a clinician who looks at the patient. So I need to know certain features about this individual, age, sex, handedness, <clears throat> and given information. I'm gonna think about it for a while. That's how doctors think. And says, yes, yes, the patient does have a um, manic depressive disorder. <clears throat> so that was what they did doctor traditionally in the 1980s they had this idea of having this expert advice codified into an expert system taking the doctor's knowledge and putting it into a rule-based system that can emulate and do what the doctor does of course <clears throat> this type of system only works if the expert the doctor's case knows the answer and can articulate it <clears throat> but the other the downside is it's only at best as good as the expert had been or as good as that person give decisions so that was the 80s. Now let's go back in time, back forward in time, back to the 2000s when supervised machine learning was taking over. <clears throat> Same basic question, you know, given description of a patient, can we predict the outcome? And there were classifiers that would do this. How would you get those classifiers? Well, there was a learning, there was an existing database of similar patients in the past where we knew the answer. And we could build a learning module, a learning system that could build a classifier from that. So that was what was done in the 2000s, and many people in this audience have worked in this regime for quite a while. But let's talk about this. <clears throat> Building a database, there's features and there's da database instances. But the other part of it is <clears throat> we're going to try to build a label, a label like does a patient have MDD? And there's also going to be the true values for those labels. I'm going to talk, focus on these topics over on the right hand side. <clears throat> so, first, what are the true values? What values should we be using for these different diagnostic or prognostic labels? So <clears throat> one approach is to do what I do. Okay, so <clears throat> yeah, who has depression? Um, you have these characteristics and this doctor, this guy here will say, here's my diagnosis. Yes, no, no, yes, no, yes, that patient. And we're done. Well, maybe another doctor says, ah, I'm not quite sure about that. <clears throat> and there can be disagreements. <clears throat> These two different medical experts might give a different diagnosis for the same individual. So which doctor should we use? If we're trying to do what I do, which I should be following? <clears throat> this issue is a common issue, this idea of Kappa scores of how doctors, how different experts, how the answers correlate with each other. One means they got it exactly right, they agree with each other. <clears throat> 0.32 means they're not doing so good. And that's true for lots of diagnostics, lots of, of um, psychiatric disorders. What about pathology scores, Gleason grading or histological ratings or whatever? <clears throat> Again, these numbers are not 1.0, they're pretty far away from it. So <clears throat> the two doctors disagree, which one's correct? Who should you believe? The most senior one, the one last, the most recent 
the one that read the most recent article on the topic? Is that what we should be doing? <clears throat> it's even worse. There's evidence of the same doctor saying yes one day and no a different day. So the doctor on Tuesday or Monday, which one should be using? So <clears throat> it looks like the do what I do is problematic. How can I do it better? <clears throat> so one approach is saying, let's not talk about what a clinician says, let's talk about an objective measure that doesn't depend on an individual person, but it's based on some objective measure, something which is unambiguous with, you know, CAPI essentially one. So what would that mean? <clears throat> so <clears throat> let's define it. An instance's label is objective if there's an unambiguous way of determining or verifying its true value. So for example, <clears throat> Hyperglycemia is defined to be a blood glucose less than 3.9. And there's instruments that can do that. And two different clinicians looking at the same instrument would agree with the instrument said. <clears throat> Patient being overweight in terms of BMI score. Well, <clears throat> you get its height, which is pretty unambiguous, and weight, and there you go, you got the answer. I'm sorry. <clears throat> and for certain classes of, of, of imaging, you know, I would say if I ask everyone in this audience here, um, I'm not a medical doctor, but I could say, yeah, I think there's something wrong. I can see some problem there. So in many, in some analog situations, again, it's ambiguous, not always, but these would be cases where I think everyone in this, in this group here would agree on the excess answer. So if it's a, if you have direct observations or computations from those measurements, <clears throat> that means objective looks like it's observable. So if I can just observe, I can read something off, why am I wasting my time? Why are we building? Why are we? Why are we building a learning system that only estimates a label? Turns out there's situations where you do want to do this. I'm going to talk about four situations: observable label, now, in the future, in the future with actions, and the future for best actions. I'm going to talk about these four, but the main focus would be the last two. So <clears throat> this <clears throat> observable label now, with that says ask about a patient's current label. So you might have a situation where an objectively observable test is expensive or painful or risky. <clears throat> so maybe you've got a predictive model that's cheap or painful or risk-free or all of the above. So simple examples for adenoma, there's colonoscopy. Even as it's perfect, it is expensive and painful and there's some risk in this whole process. <clears throat> Our friends at Metabolomics Technology Incorporated built a tool, PolyPDX, that's a urine test that's much cheaper, painless, you know, you just pee in a cup and it's risk-free. Another example is fatty liver. There is a gold standard, you do a biopsy. And again, even if that was objective, it's probably closer. It's still as expensive and painful and some risks, <clears throat> but our colleagues <clears throat> at MetaEI and many others have ultrasound techniques that do the same thing, but a much more cheaper, painless and risk-free approach. So even if, there is an objective way to get it now, it might be worth having an, a better way to do it as an approximation. More interesting is when you want the patients to ask later in the future. So I want to learn to predict a model about a patient now based on results of a future test, a future objective test. <clears throat> so <clears throat> patients wait in 30 days. Now in 30 days, I got a scale, I can measure the person's weight, done. But today I don't know it. Or A1C in three months for a diabetic looking at, at a measure of, of, um, of his diabetic of glycemic response. <clears throat> or the Beck depressive inventory for someone uh, who might have depression as on eight weeks from now. So these are examples of, of situations where later on there's an objective measure, but I want to know it now. I know the predictive model now that can help me get that. So this is the objective <clears throat> label for the future. Now, this colon A for the action, suppose I ask this question after taking some specific action. So what's someone's weight if he's on the paleo diet? What's A1C if he has this particular diabetic regimen in terms of uh, CR and CF factors? Or what will this person's uh, BDI, back to present inventory, be in eight weeks if he takes an SSRI? So <clears throat> these are the three cases. The fourth case is the most interesting and most useful, the hardest one. What is the best action a patient should take? This is just saying, given an action, what happens? This is what action should be prescribed. So we'll earn a predictive model that says for a given patient, I want to know now what I should do 
which actually gives you the best outcome. <clears throat> and so you know, I might know what's the best weight in 30 days. And there's a paleo diet, a Mediterranean, a vegan, and no diet. And, or what's the best A1C <clears throat> when I have these factors of, of these numbers? Or what's the best uh, BDI score in eight weeks, given these particular uh, antipsychotics or treatment regimens? So <clears throat> this is a question, and you might maybe the answer is the vegan diet's best or this or that. <clears throat> So we're going to see some problems about this so-called objective label. Some, some problems. We'll talk about that soon. Let me quickly summarize <clears throat> these four measures. Objective label now says, here's a patient. The label will be the weight. An objective measure is a scale. Objective in the future, <clears throat> again, here's a patient now. In 30 days, <clears throat> I'm going to ask what the weight is. And there's a number. <laughs> Didn't do so good. <clears throat> um, objective with a future with action, well, now I also have an action with a vegan diet. I can ask what happens now, I'm actually get better. And now the best action would say, here's a patient, tell me the action that'll be best. Vegan was the best one, or, or Mediterranean or no diet. So that's the type of objective labels and the type of scenarios where you might want to do it. I'll let in my talk, I gave some motivation and background 40 years ago and, and 10 years ago and now up to, up to modern times, I talked about learning models which are objective <coughs> and actionable. <coughs> I'm going to talk about some issues. So I'm going to talk about these two terms. Uh, first, what does it mean to be objective? Some more issues there. And then a lot about actionable. This section is going to give a quick overview of some topics. And there's some subtle issues I'm going to talk about here. So this will be very simple. I think it's more elaborations. So <coughs> where are we now? I talked about type of objective labels. I'm going to talk about what objectivity means. There's some subtleties there. And they give a formal definition of the task before going to this guy, the, the final, the third, the fourth of the tasks. Objectivity. So I gave a definition. <clears throat> An instance's label is objective if there's unambiguous, you know, cap equals one, way to determine or verify its true label. Think of it as being sort of independent of the observer, as opposed to obje uh, objective, not objective, which are subjective, based interviews or interpretations. So again, we would say this is objective, which we are off. <clears throat> Sometimes, you know, not all images, but many images, there's a, a pretty high concordance, high. <clears throat> what about this self-report? That's a little more complicated, and that goes contrary to what many doctors say. Let me talk about this issue. <clears throat> so let me compare. The veracity of two statements. One statement is P equals NP. For people who aren't in computing science, this is a hotly contested object uh, claim that's been debated for um, <clears throat> 50 years. It's been quite a while. <clears throat> so that's a claim that might or might be true. Another claim is Russ. I'm Russ. Russ says P equals NP. Decades of research haven't resolved this one. <clears throat> Russ just said P equals NP. Everyone in this audience would say, yeah, that's what happened. That's objective. You, as observers, will confirm that I said P equals NP. I'm, I don't know if I'm right or not, but you could agree I said that. So <clears throat> consider also the things. The veracity of a doctor saying Fred is sad. Well, that's a subjective opinion, subjective to the clinician. Versus Fred saying Fred is sad. <clears throat> that's objective. <clears throat> All of us would watch Fred saying it and say, yeah, that's what he said. <clears throat> so this is, I'm talking about a clinician objective. The patient's. It might be patient subject. The patient might not know what sad means and my, my disagreements, but we all agree that that's what he said. It might be deceptive, but that's what he said. For people who know about SOAP, subjective objective assessment plan, this is backwards from what that means. So when I say objective, I mean clinician objective. Two clinicians will agree on some statement. Okay, that's one subtlety. <clears throat> now we talked about true labels. So which one should we use? And I gave this example before. Maybe we're asking the wrong question. <clears throat> Maybe we should be saying, <clears throat> let's have an objective label, not the doctor's idea. <clears throat> but let's define it as being, let's define it. BDI is a self-report. The patient puts in numbers, puts in values. You add them up and you get a score. And two clinicians will look at the patient's self-report and say, yep, that score is greater than 10 or not. So now it's unambiguous. <clears throat> Again, the patient might be deceptive and wrong. Let's ignore that. Two clinicians will agree. Uh, by looking at the scores, what the score should be. 
So we can redefine depression as being BDI greater than 10 and replace that. Uh, and so the depression label use that one. Okay, now let's talk about, I'll tell you more formal definition of what these different tasks involve. So this first task, uh, I want to, the truth is some function that goes from the patient description to the actual objective outcome. <clears throat> That's the truth, given a patient. The outcome happened to be a real number. And we're looking, the learning task is find me a patient, find me a model like this, find me a function f hat, which is similar to the truth, which gives you close answers. And what does close mean? <clears throat> well, the real numbers look at an L2 score, the yeah, expected value. So that'd be a simple task. You want to minimize that. <clears throat> for the objective in the future, it's the same thing. It's just, it's just in the future, but everything's the same as was for the now case. I want a, a predictor that gives a good estimate. <clears throat> for the future with an action, it's one complexity. <clears throat> it's a model from a patient description and an action to go to a weight, or to go to a, a, a real value in this case. And now this function makes two arguments, x and a. <clears throat> and once again, it gives if the real values, I can look at the L2 loss. And I can minimize that. <clears throat> All that's straightforward. Okay. That was fun and games. <clears throat> Let's go to what I'm really interested in. None of, nothing I talked about so far was actionable. They all just observe what happened in the world. Let's talk about actions. <clears throat> and I'm going to talk about several topics here. <clears throat> So let's go back to what I just talked about. <clears throat> After we use, we define BDI less, greater than, less than 10 as being what I care about, that's wonderful. We're done. <clears throat> I can use that to produce a label training set, learn a model, and diagnose novel patients. End of story. I've solved all the problems. Have I? Now what? <clears throat> patients has depression. What do you do? There's medications, there's selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and SNRIs and NRIs, and there's drugs like ketamine. Maybe that's gonna work. Oh, or therapies, cognitive behavioral therapy or electroshock shock therapies. Maybe that's what I should do. There are combinations. Once you know the patient has this, treat, this disease, you just treat it, right? Treat it. Well, <clears throat> subtle. Different patients respond to different treatments. And in fact, many patient papers have shown that only 50% respond to any single antidepressant. You get the wrong antidepressant, but it doesn't work. You have to try a second one, a third one, or a fourth one. <clears throat> Why do we want to know if the patient has MDD if we don't know what to do about it? Why are we doing that? So that goes to the next topic. <clears throat> so I talked about the true values and why you want that to be objective. <clears throat> but what about the label? Why are we asking about MDD? Maybe we should be saying, who's the patient who's going to respond to cognitive behavioral therapy? Isn't that the question we, the doctor we care about? How can I make a patient better? What action should I take? Okay, so let's go back to the little diagram. Here's here are the three patients. And we asked Dr. One and she says, here's my recommendation. And Dr. Two doesn't agree all the time. What do we do? You know, older, you know, older doctor, the one who writes most recent article. Let's ask a different question. Let's ask a question. What label should we use from some objective measure that has the most effective response? So look at treatments. So imagine if you're putting um, SSRIs versus C CBT. <clears throat> and I wanna know which one gives me a BDI less than 10 in eight weeks. So that's my objective measure. So which one should I use? Well, <clears throat> I want the one I could, I could do. This is the FA, the feature with an action. I can now say what the outcome was here. It's yes or no. But what I really want to know is not this one, but I want to know which one gives me the best action, the best action to take. Best action. <laughs> that means, well, SSRIs work for this patient. <clears throat> but what if I gave this patient cognitive behavior therapy? CPT works this one, but what if SSRIs? Maybe it would have been better. This patient didn't respond to SSRIs, maybe different. So if I could look at selection bias and counterfactual issues, maybe I could figure out the best, the best decision to make. And the label would be, well, the one that gave me the yes answer, or a label gave me a yes answer. So I might be right, I might be wrong. You can imagine solving the problem that way. So why did we say for this patient, SSRIs with the right answer? Well, the answer is 
Uh, yes is better than no. You know, I want the score to be less than 10 rather than greater than 10. <clears throat> okay, so it requires an evaluation. It's not just yes or no, but yes is good and no is bad. So, okay, <clears throat> that's a start. <clears throat> Let's go through a second example. <clears throat> here's comic book guy, you know, from Simpsons. <clears throat> what diet? Now here's a description of this person. What diet? Well, I can again ask the first question of what happens if he takes a different, different possible between paleo, vegan, or diet, I can say, imagine, imagine for the moment, I'll come back to it in a second, that I knew what would happen under paleo, vegan, and no diet. And I can say, the best is obviously paleo because look, he wants to lose weight and this one, he lost the most weight. He, lost, you know, he went to the lowest final value. So why did I choose paleo as the best action for comic book guy for these three options? Well, <clears throat> because 225 is better than these two numbers. I want the smallest weight. So I want to find the value I want it for the smallest number. Now you can say, well, maybe not rest. Maybe starvation is not a good answer. But, <clears throat> but again, so there's values there. And maybe small is good for certain times, but maybe it's not quite so simple. <clears throat> uh, do you really want the smallest value? There's a value decision here. And we have to think carefully about that. So back to the formal description um, for the objective labels best action. <clears throat> to do that, <clears throat> the truth is a model that maps from a patient and an action to a label, which in this case is, is <clears throat> the decision and what the best thing to do is. <clears throat> and, and I have a value function that maps, oh, I'm sorry, maps to a value with the best value here. So I can have a g of x, and that's going to be the argument. So I, I have a way to say, given the state of the world that happens, so why is the state of the world? If this, if if comic book guy takes vegan, this is this is the weight he has, and now here's a valuation function of how of a real number for that weight, <clears throat> and g of x is going to be r max. It's going to be the action which which maximizes that score. <clears throat> but notice this is the first time I had to have evaluation. Here's the state of the world. How good is that state? <clears throat> so a learner is going to seek a model, a G hat, that's similar to G. <clears throat> and what does similar mean? Well, I'm talking about expected loss of this distribution. <clears throat> this is <clears throat> the value of the best possible action. This is the true action I should have taken. And this is the value I get if I use the action of my approximation, my guess. So this would be a loss, which again, I try to minimize. But if you look at this for a second, <clears throat> I'm trying to find the, I want to find the G hat, which does the best job there, the G hat, which minimizes that score. And <clears throat> notice this part here doesn't depend on G hat. This is, you know, this is the actual best answer possible, but I don't get to see that. But I'm going to subtract it. It's, if I want to maximize A minus some variable, you know, seven minus a variable, maximizing that's the same as just minimizing that value. So that suggests, instead of talking about expected loss and how much worse I do than the best possible answer, I look at arg max, the best possible thing for this. So this minus sign here flips a bit from, from max to min. So I would talk about trying to maximize. I want to find the action which does as good a job as possible, which produces a state whose value is as large as possible. I hope people are tracking. There's a lot of different funny things here, but What's critical to realize is before I just said, what happens if you, if you follow this trajectory? Now I'm saying, what happens if you follow other trajectories? And which one's best? And best requires understanding this value, having a value function. So back to comic book guy, <coughs> is F y sub a is the state that happens, which is the case is just his weight, <coughs> uh, this person on diet A after eight weeks. So for example, here I'm going to define it as being 240 is current weight minus Y. Lose as many pounds as possible. That's what I'm saying here. <clears throat> so if I got to see the outcome, I would say the one that maximizes the value of this, it's going to be the one that's going to be 15. I want the, the amount of pounds lost to be as large as possible. Maximize weight, maximize the number of weight lost. <clears throat> so you can <clears throat> go forward and say, now suppose now suppose my model of the world 
isn't quite right. Suppose my model, <coughs> you know, this is the true value, but I'm wrong. I, I've got a model, this y hat, this, this thing I'm approximating, <coughs> that actually wasn't quite right. That was actually saying um, the scores I get are going to be 252 pounds and 220 and 239. If that's my model of the world, what advice do I give comic book guy? <coughs> the right answer is paleo, but if I, if I have this wrong interpretation of the world, wrong model, <coughs> I'm going to say the one that I think minimizes his weight is going to be vegan. That's my best, my best guess. Because I think he loses 12 pounds, whereas with paleo, he gains 12. That's not good. And with no diet, he loses that one pound. <coughs> so here, my approximation based on wrong and based on my wrong guess, I, I say the loss is actually, I say the vegan is the best answer because that's what I think is the best. So using that value, I can say, how good is a model? What, how good, what's the quality of this particular model that was based on my wrong approximation? I'm gonna say, I'm gonna choose vegan and I'm gonna, so I think it does best, but how good is vegan actually? <laughs> Turns out vegan actually is not that good. So the actual score I get, the value I get by this incorrect assumption <clears throat> is gonna score 235, which again is 10 pounds worse than it could have been had I guessed correctly, had I told the patient a better model, which would have been a good paleo. So again, I appreciate people might get confused. I'll make the slides available. You can squint at the slides later on, make sure that all makes sense. But again, dependent on the valuation function here, and dependent on my approximation, the thing I thought would be the best action. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so <clears throat> just recapitulating. Um, for any, if I have imperfect predictor that given a state and action produces, a, produce, given a patient and an action produces my, um, my prediction of the state, I can get scores that I look at. Uh, the actual score I get, I'm gonna choose that. I wanna make this as high as possible. The quality I get is actually measured based on the truth, not based on my approximation. So I still need, this is F, not F hat. That's the quality I should get by use that, that approach. Okay. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so that was talking about um, what this thing is. And I, I apologize, it's a little more complicated than I hoped it would be, but you need to go, you need to have a value, you need to have this, this label, you know, the state of the world and its value, all of which are essential components. Let me catch my breath, <coughs> go to the next topic, which is what is the, the label that comes out if I use this future in action? <coughs> so <coughs> back to depression, imagine here's a patient and I give the patient uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. And I look at a score between one and five for suicidal thoughts that happen afterwards. And maybe it's pretty good here. But other factors when you give medications is weight gain and and other measures like anhedonia, get made up examples. So the label itself might have a vector, <clears throat> suicidality, weight gain, anhedonia, maybe other factors that, that clinicians, that psychiatrists would have to look at. <clears throat> so for the, for the objective label FA, the response could be a vector, suicidality, weight gain, anhedonia. <clears throat> In general, <clears throat> you can imagine the outcome being a state, not a single number, but a triple of numbers or maybe more, maybe like the drug effectives and side effects, maybe how much it costs, how much it costs them to dollars or how much time it takes or other things could be also part of the equation, part of the outcome. And so here I could say for this patient, oh, oh that's weird, okay, my animation did, okay, animation is the wrong thing, sorry about that. So under here, I would see the different values that, um, the different response, again, I made this up obviously, but uh, what treatment's best for John? So is 202 better than 125 or 340? What's the best answer for John? <clears throat> well, I can't answer it. Like, that's nice about a real number. I can tell larger or smaller. If I have three numbers, it's not clear what I wanna do. Now, <clears throat> the value function is something that takes this output state and the output state maps that onto onto a, a single number. <clears throat> so maybe John thinks, you ask him, he says, suicidal thoughts is three times worse than waking. I don't care about anhedonia. 
So he would have a weight, which is three times this plus zero times that, oh, I'm sorry, plus, plus, plus this minus two times that. Again, I made this up. And so he would give these numbers. I want to pick the largest of these numbers. So he would say the largest, the least negative is, he says CPT, that's what I think is good for me. That's what drug money is. That's based on my personal idea of, of how I will have my valuation function works. Now, if you ask John's mother, she might have a different opinion. She would say, actually, they all are bad, equally bad. Like I made this up. And she would choose the one, she would have this valuation function. And the least, the one which had the, the least negative number would now be SSRIs. So based on the different value functions, you make different answers. <clears throat> so uh, this again, based on what the true answer would be if I actually had the right estimate. And again, if you have approximation, you get different answers as well. But at least this is if if you was if you had perfect information, they would get different answers because there's different values. And you can imagine different hospitals having different descriptions of what should happen next. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> this is points out the value function is critical. Yeah, for weight gain, of course, I want to minimize weight. Yes, if, I want, if, I, if I'm running a company, I want to make as much money so I can imagine a single value, but it was complicated. There might be many different features, all of which compete, and you want to try to see which one's better. I can have all three of the features, but no, you can't. You need to have an evaluation to say which, you need to have a single value to say, I prefer this over that. And you need to have a single real value. That real value can be kind of life or death, or, or dollars, or, or quality adjusted life years, or whatever it is. You can't have a single number for that. <clears throat> it must be objectively computed. I'm still interested in objective actual decisions. It's got to be real, a single real number, not nominal, you know, not uh, Canada versus, uh, versus US. Uh, it can't be, it's got to be a number for these different states. It can't be a vector. I have to compare them. <clears throat> so it could be a linear combination, it could be nonlinear. But I have to have a single number at the end. Critical, critical point. This is not learned. <laughs> you go to a clinician and say, tell me your evaluation function. They say, okay, right, you tell me. No, I'm not a medical doctor. I don't see the patient, I don't treat the patients. You tell me. It can vary from hospital to hospital, from doctor to doctor. <clears throat> you can vary from patient to patient. What does the patient care about? So that's the evaluation function. <clears throat> So now the other problem, <clears throat> this objective label is the fact that it's not really objective by the name. So back to that little example here, <clears throat> I said, imagine we knew what the answer was. So if you say, if I give the patient paleo, I can then give the patient paleo, uh, have them do the paleo diet, wait a month you know, and weigh it, 225, objective. I got it, it's objective, I know that value. <clears throat> but is this the best thing we could do? <clears throat> the best means it did better than the other scores. Well, <clears throat> how good would he have done with vegan or with no diet? <clears throat> I don't know. <clears throat> uh, he wasn't on those diets. I don't get to see them. I saw what happens with the current trajectory, with the current plan. With other diets, <clears throat> I have no idea. <clears throat> okay, so this is counterfactual reasoning. That's why I put the little tilde there because it's not really objective. <clears throat> And here I'm just repitching the same thing. <clears throat> now, why don't we go back in time and solve the problem? I talked about time machines earlier. I don't have a time machine. Right? I don't know what happens. <clears throat> well, why don't I just give them a paleo diet now? And then a month later, I give them a different diet or a year later. Well, <clears throat> you could imagine this. <clears throat> the downside is he's not the same patient. He's a year older now. He's already tried this other diet. He's got, he now has a girlfriend. You know, now different things are happening. You could say, well, I'm going to assume it's the same. Well, you can assume that, but that doesn't mean it's going to be correct. <clears throat> we really don't know what the, 2020, what the 2021 comic book guy would have done under these diets, and we never will. <clears throat> so that was an overview of these two things. There are some issues I want to cover now. <clears throat> so let me go through the issues. <clears throat> One is I just said, we can't objectively verify the best action. <clears throat> we can't because you don't know other actions, we don't know, <clears throat> but there's a solution using distributionally objective things, which are now, I'll talk, I'll define that. Another problem, <clears throat> right, my first proposal to some colleagues, they said, yeah, well, doctors, the GP make a decision. 
that's great. What about the what about the pathologist who gave a pass report? What's actionable about that? Stay tuned. We're going to talk about having multi-step actions as a way to show that they still are part of this overall uh, most effective action policies. <clears throat> How do you evaluate extended model? which have multiple steps. I'll talk about expected costs for that. <clears throat> Finally, if I have time, I'll talk about this um, sampling bias issue and how do you, why RCTs are way around that. So <clears throat> back to the objective verifying. So there's comic book guy, <clears throat> there's a description of him, he got a diet <clears throat> um, and that's the way it happened. <clears throat> now, let's imagine in your mind's eye, <clears throat> I got a diet. He had twins, he had identical people, right? identical individuals. You know, this, you know, I had time machine, went back in time and went forward again. These are the same individuals. <clears throat> now, for different individuals, I could do an RCT type of thing. You know, just, you know, you get this, you get vegan, you get paleo, I can look what happened. And now I can say, <clears throat> this was five, that was seven. I want to maximize that. So the best diet is paleo. Let me be really careful. <clears throat> The best diet over this, these eight individuals was, was paleo because the average for this, average for vegan was worse than average for paleo. <clears throat> so again, the same sort of model here. I can talk about having a distribution. I have a population of patients. I can apply this action over this distribution of patients. And then I'll say, I'm gonna choose the best action, the one that did best over this distribution and take that for everybody. Okay, <clears throat> so now I can talk about the expected value of evaluation and so forth. <clears throat> so that was kind of a bit silly, but what if I didn't have comic book, but I had a bunch of other individuals and I want to model for everybody. I could do, you know, again, RCT type of thing and randomize them to vegan or paleo and now see what happens. And I, you know, the weight at time zero minus the weight three days later and I get scores. And now it turns out over this distribution of patients, I can say that in fact, vegan is the best action. That's when I maximized the expected value. <clears throat> so what am I doing here? I'm saying there's a bunch of actions here. It's just two actions I'm thinking about. <clears throat> I draw samples from the underlying distribution. I ID from the distribution. I run action. You know, for this sample, I run paleo. For this one, I run or vegan. I then look at the scores at the expected average over those. There's, there's the hat over that. <clears throat> and then I take the, the best action for that. <clears throat> and I say vegan is one that's preferred. Oh, well, good. Um, if everyone must take the same action, this is the best thing to do. <clears throat> and again, I'll skip the details. Just saying that, <clears throat> assuming this evaluation for an individual is is um, is objective, then taking the max or a finite set of them is also objective. And so <clears throat> this whole thing is objective. This is kind of like average treatment effect, not an individual treatment effect. <clears throat> um, make it a little bit better. Instead of saying everyone takes the same specific action, everyone gets vegan, <clears throat> what if I say instead, <clears throat> I'm going to define a policy which says, I'm going to first ask about sex. Males get paleo, women get vegan. So this is not a single action. This is a complex thing. <clears throat> what happens now? <clears throat> well, again, I've got three actions. I could take, I could give everyone paleo, everyone vegan, or I can have this dis distribution. I'm going to make a decision, have this more complex thing. <clears throat> and now I can, again, the same thing, the same thing I did earlier. I can now look at samples from these different things and look at the expected value, an empirical expected value, and now take, and now choose an action, choose a complex action, which is the best. <clears throat> so here, seven is the best. In this particular case, the best action is a complex thing, which isn't just paleo or 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 vegan, it could be a complex thing. <clears throat> this segues to the next topic, multi-step actions. <clears throat> so <clears throat> some actions require many steps. Doctors, you know, GPs know they have to get pathology reports and imaging scans and genetic tests to rule in and rule out some possible diagnosis and perhaps the treatment decisions. So or you might sequentially consider several treatments. So I can think of this, uh, think of an action as a policy, <clears throat> a whole sequence of things to do. <clears throat> From the sequence, I'm going to give a value of that sequence, just as I did a moment ago, based on the sex, I'd use paleo or vegan to make a decision. Here I might do a lab test and, and bachelor and, and bifurcate based on that. So, <clears throat> so 
the thing gets gets comic book guy gets gets paid, I would say, I use this decision. Okay, again, I already went through. So the actual <coughs> output would be the score for the different steps, you know, the, the sex that was determined, and then and then his weight in four weeks. And for this person, again, we have all these different factors. <coughs> so with that in mind, let me talk about a slightly more complicated, well, maybe easier example, but <coughs> a very familiar case. Imagine I have a screening a diagnostic test, well, a screening test. And here <coughs> I have this test DX. And now <coughs> I'm going to run a test, and then it's going to report yes or no. If it says no, then I just do nothing. And after a month, I look at the patient, and I objectively say, yep, yes, he's healthy, or no, he's sick. <coughs> so one of these two things. So the test was negative, and either, and either he's healthy or he's sick. If the test said, <coughs> Test said he, that he's positive. <clears throat> then I ran treatment. And in this particular simplified world, the treatment always works. It solves a problem. Whatever the problem was, it solves 100% effective. <clears throat> so this, this, the, the action of a diagnosis and treatment is going to be one of these three values. It's either it was negative, but a patient was fine, negative, the patient wasn't fine, <clears throat> or was treated and it was fine after that. And you can imagine again, give it SSRI, and if it works, you're done. If it doesn't work, then try an SNRI. If it doesn't if it works great, otherwise, yeah, yada, yada, yada. You can imagine strategies like that, where there's some things I know about, things I don't know, and there's outcomes. You can imagine um, a screening test, and then a diagnostic test, and then a treatment. Uh, the diagnostics, you know, for therapy and diagnostics is in this framework. <clears throat> Information gathering, this person's sex, BMI, these are things you just look at conditional things, different paths of the tree, or maybe doing conditional things. And at this state, you do other sort of tests. You can measure very complicated things. <clears throat> These intermediate steps, other agents, genetic information, pathology information, and so forth. And then you assemble the response to sign the treatment. <clears throat> so <clears throat> you need to do all these things. <clears throat> okay, I'm running out of time. So let me just say, <clears throat> what is the value of one of these tests, of one of these things? It isn't a single, you know, minimize the score and look at BDI, but it's a complicated thing. It requires knowing the cost of the tests and, and the cost for different states for dying, for being healthy or not healthy, and the probably success of these different tests. <clears throat> Let's talk about that now. How do I evaluate an actionable model like that? <clears throat> so here's the example here. You run diagnostic tests, it was negative, you stop, Otherwise, you run. <clears throat> what's the what's the cost of what's the cost of this? Well, someone has to tell me the cost. <clears throat> Here's a situation where the, the diagnostic test cost me hundred dollars. The treatment costs five hundred dollars. And also, by the way, how bad is it to be sick? It costs two thousand dollars. And not being sick, it costs zero dollars. Good. So, so that, that sort of makes sense. Again, I made these numbers up, but you can imagine for a screening test what it costs and what the outcomes could be. And, <clears throat> Let's imagine we just have dollars, ignore the issues of, of quality and depth and so forth, just dollars right now. <clears throat> now you also need probabilities. <clears throat> What's the probability of being sick initially? What's the distribution of patients? 60%? How, how effective is this diagnostic procedure? <clears throat> Here I'm saying, if the person really was sick, the chance of being claimed to be sick is 95%. If he really was healthy, the chance of being called, told healthy was 0.9. So these are specificity and sensitivity numbers. That's good. And the treatment I already told you. The treatment, the chance of being sick afterwards, after you're treated, after the diagnosis is positive and treated, is zero. There's no chance of still being sick. Simple model. <clears throat> so I'm going to how do you evaluate? I'm going to use the other bit because each time about cost. <clears throat> I follow your path. What's the cost for this trajectory uh, for a true negative? I, I clarity was you know, clarity was healthy and sure if he was healthy, the cost of that's going to be, you know, <clears throat> it's a chance, it's probably being sick, which is 0.4, one minus this, times the probability of being uh, initially not being sick, being healthy, and having a negative result. So it's 0.36. And what's the cost? It costs hundred dollars for the diagnostic test. About this patient, <clears throat> well, uh, the chance of a false negative is, do the math, it's going to be 0 0.6 times 0 0.05, so it's 3%. 3%. And the cost here is $100 for 
to this test, plus 2,000 because he's still sick at the end. What about this test? And again, I'm running out of time, but just you do the math and it's easy to see. 61, notice 0.36 plus 0.03 plus 0.61, that adds to one. Every patient, exactly one of these. What's the expected cost of this particular screening policy? <clears throat> it's 0.36 times 100 plus 0.03 times 100 plus 0.61 times 600, it's $465. <clears throat> we can ask questions like, is this test effective? This test is 465. What about the treat everybody? What's that cost? <clears throat> well, um, treat everyone. That costs $5 for everybody. Which would you rather spend? This test is cost effective. You can also ask, what if you treat nobody and see what that cost is? You can do that math and get certain numbers there also. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the people in the audience who do reinforcement learning said, come on, Russ, we knew this, right? This is, this is the overall reward of a policy and this is the reward. And so this is all familiar to people from RL, <clears throat> but you can talk about information gathering and so forth and put in this medical context, which is not the way doctors think about it. Okay. <clears throat> um, I also have a paper on learning active classifiers who talked about exactly this uh, 20 years ago. <clears throat> um, okay, so let me. <clears throat> So you can actually look at for arbitrary values in terms of the positive, the, the chance of being sick initially and the sensing specificity and the cost and you get certain numbers and you get this simple formula, sort of, you know, <clears throat> simple multiplications and linear combinations. <clears throat> it's worth observing that the cost of a treatment, that depends on the diagnostic tool. What's the cost of diagnosis? What is the, the efficacy of this diagnostics in terms of these numbers? It also depends on the world. <clears throat> What's the cost of being sick? Uh, 2,000 or 500 or 7,000 cost of treatment. And also the diagnostic test knows nothing about what is the underlying population, how many people are sick in this environment. <clears throat> so you can talk about certain things for fixed environments, different, different diagnostics have different properties. Uh, which one's best will depend on the environment. There are other measures to use. Yeah. <clears throat> you can talk about, uh, we're talking about expected, expected value. People look at penalties and zero in an AUC, and they might give a different opinion. They're wrong. <clears throat> um, I care about this one. If you want to know why not to use AUC, talk to me about it. I'll tell you why it's a dumb idea, but that's a different talk. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> just observe quickly that, as I, if I can imagine, two different diagnostic procedures with different costs. This costs 50 versus 40, and they have different accuracies. And you can imagine in this environment where the 60% of the population is. Uh, is sick and these are the costs. Here, the expected value for diagnostic A is the cost is better, so use A. <clears throat> but if I change it and make it only 10% are, are sick initially, now the other one's better. <clears throat> if I change the cost of being sick to $2,010, then again, so always different cases. So I'm just emphasizing that it depends on the environment, which one's best. Okay. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> sampling bias, uh, I'm gonna skip that. Okay, so, so some issues about sampling bias. I'm running out of time to just point out that <clears throat> what makes it interesting here is these other models <clears throat> just looked at, at a particular patient, or maybe this looked at a patient and an action, which is from the longer policy drawn from the distribution. <clears throat> this model requires knowing the response from every action, but you only get to observe one of them for a patient. So I think the counterfactual reasoning. <clears throat> um, I mentioned this issue about how you have to have the sampling bias. <clears throat> And again, I'm gonna just the standard sort of examples of why if you just if you just draw if just if the sicker patients get this treatment and the healthier get that pa if if the sicker patients get operations and healthier patients get get medication, um, you're gonna it's gonna look like treatment A did better for everyone because everyone I looked at its average value is higher, <clears throat> but of course that's because I looked at a biased sampling. Look at the whole population, <clears throat> you'll see that in fact you're better off. Getting, getting operation, it's a skewed sample, and you can show that. Okay. Yada, yada, yada. <coughs> okay. RCTs. <coughs> so, what's you want to objectively verify the person's best? Having a distributionally objective function makes sense. Why gather intermediate information? Multi step is essential here. How to evaluate it? It's expected cost. Those are that sampling bias, <coughs> uh, RCT like things that solve that issue. <coughs> so, there's our clinician friend. I think, boy, you've given me the tools I need, right? So I now know how to 
how to model and evaluate multi-step actions to produce policies that could actually be better in the objective sense of mind. So this is how I can make it better. <clears throat> so let me wrap up. <clears throat> skip this and skip this. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about here. <clears throat> I talked about do what I do versus objective labels. Why are, why are so many tools being developed do what I do? One answer is <clears throat> it's very intuitive. <clears throat> and in fact, <clears throat> This is how doctors are trained, right? They do an apprenticeship. They follow another doctor and try to learn what this master, what he or she did. So it's very intuitive, it makes sense. It doesn't require data, it just requires his or her opinion. And does not require an explicit valuation function. I talked to lots of doctors, not one of them can tell me the value function. And that's good, they don't need it for this model. On the other hand, it's only as good as the expert and experts may not be perfect. And I said this was a feature. It's actually a bug. This valuation function is critical. What are you trying to do? <clears throat> if you can't tell me what you're trying to do, why are you doing it? You want to, well, generate to other populations, tell me what you're trying to do. And we have a way to actually answer that question. <clears throat> Having an explicit valuation function is critical to doing science rather than just an art form. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> How do you operationalize this idea? What label should you use? <clears throat> Ask yourself the question, why do you care about this? <clears throat> How will you use this in a decision? If you can't use a decision, why are you doing it? <clears throat> I, look for, I look for a prognosis, not diagnosis. Does the patient have depression? Where is a tumor? Does the patient have a stroke? Forget those questions. Should this patient get SSRI? That's a question you care about. What area should be irradiated? That's what you care about. Should this patient be airlifted to a stroke clinic? <clears throat> Forget the word stroke, ask that question. <clears throat> What are the true labels? Make it objective. If you, can if you can't do this, if you cannot have quantitative measures, you can't evaluate the quality of the predictions. You can't see how good the resulting states are. <clears throat> this just sort of repeats. <clears throat> the cost means you can assign, assign costs and use that to solve the real world problem. What are you actually trying to do? You get answers if you use this approach. <clears throat> They're agnostic and so forth. <clears throat> By the way, I describe this as a, I'm a learning person. This isn't really about learning per se. This is more about if you program it, you still have the same sort of vision. What are you trying to do? State that precisely. <clears throat> Who defines the objective function? <clears throat> it's a medical issue, not a computer science issue. The medical team should provide that <clears throat> or the health hospital administrator or somebody. I'll talk to you about it, but it's your decision. <clears throat> um, again, I know all of my reinforcement learning Colleagues will say, come on, Russ, we knew this. It's about time you caught up. Yeah, you're right. <clears throat> this is the, the way they view the world. <clears throat> what is the goal? They go at actual performance tasks. What are the consequences of making the wrong decisions? Don't just use AUC, say, I'm going to make this decision. Here's what happens if I'm wrong, pop, false false or false negatives, and what happens? Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> if you if the final final bullets, right? Remember this one slide. It says, if the only verification for prediction is it matches an expert and there's no way to validate it, <clears throat> it doesn't affect the world. You're asking the wrong question. If the prediction doesn't inform an action, why are you doing it? <clears throat> why are you bothering? Why? Do, uh, yeah, it's good for science, yada, yada. I, I understand. <clears throat> why don't you do science? Tell me the action you, you do a response to that. This is objective, that's actionable. <clears throat> Those are friends and yes, this is how you can do what I do, but better. I have these ideas. <clears throat> I want to thank my colleagues. I've got wonderful students and postdocs who have given great insights here. Roberto and Nagar and, and Naraj have all contributed, as well as many other people have given me feedback on this. <clears throat> my medical colleagues in the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry, AHS, <clears throat> have done wonderful things. Uh, uh, Jacob Dremko has given me some good feedback, and many other people have also contribute this. My Amy and computer science people, I really appreciate. This is sponsored by various students, funders. And I'll stop here and ask for questions. Ah. Questions? Yeah. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, everyone, if you have any questions, please I, feel free to unmute yourself. Sandra has raised it. And did hand, you want so. did, did you want to turn off the turn off the recording now? Or if you want just to I guess uh, it's off. up to you if you want to uh, and take questions offline okay. so I can. Uh, I'm happy. Up the... Sandra. Uh, thank you, Russ. That was a very nice, uh, enlightening talk. Thanks for that. Um, you spoke a lot about um, 
choosing the best action. And I was wondering whether specifically in the medical domain, quite often, maybe you might be happy to pick an action that is perhaps suboptimal, but uh, that leads to the, to the desired state with reasonable cost. And, you know, maybe you would, uh, in a machine learning point of, from a machine learning point of view, discard a model that, that does not often pick the best action, but actually for practical purposes, it might be the much better model because it more often picks uh, an action that leads to uh, a goal state and reasonable time, even if not quite optimal. Great question. Um, I should, you are my plants, aren't you, Sarah? Because I've got, I've got a, I had a whole bunch of things that I was anticipating you might ask. <clears throat> like a, what answers? Maybe the answer immediately. So that's one point that you that you, you got to. <clears throat> so it may take a long time to give an answer, but you need an answer right now. So that's another reason to do an immediate thing. So a stroke where every second counts. A quick test that gives you information rather than a definitive CT scan later on. And if people heard about COVID, you know, the answer actually is like five days from now when you look at other factors. But rapid tests give the correct answer maybe in a day or your PCR takes a day and rapid takes 20 minutes. You might want that as a surrogate. So that's one answer to your question of just immediate. You know, one, of the, one of the features could be time it takes and you can put that into the equation. The other answer is, is talking about satisficing. Uh, a lot of times, yeah, I want to get ideal weight, and this is slides I took out because I'm going to talk to you. Um, come on, fast. You can imagine other models, like just make it less than 240 or in certain interval. And sometimes a satisficing answer, you can just say, again, I'm skipping things, but you can imagine uh, as soon as I'm doing satisfying, as soon as I get an answer which is good enough, I can stop. And so this is optimal because I want someone, I can know that this actually is objectively measured because it's satisfying. So these are two answers to questions you kind of asked. Does this address the points you were dealing with or? Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks. I'm, uh, <laughs> it's nice that you have my question anticipated okay. already. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm channeling, I'm bringing people like you, Sam. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, same question over again. <clears throat> so again, I'll, I'll make the slides available if you want to squint at it later on. <clears throat> um, I'm also happy to answer questions in general. I think this is something that, that this whole analysis, you know, I'm going to stop sharing side of it. <clears throat> oh, uh, Chris. Hi, yeah, thanks. That was a fantastic talk. Do you think there are any issues with objectivity in the actions themselves? <clears throat> what do you mean by that? Like, for example, doing a test um, or, do, or going on a diet, uh, there's ways that those could be subjective as well, right? Well, you mean, <clears throat> if, I, if I'm going to the vegan diet, I'm going to the vegan diet. Now, maybe I don't actually follow it. <clears throat> so maybe I don't actually go on it, <clears throat> but I'm, do you have a specific example in mind for your question? Um, kind of. So when, like, when we do a lot of work with ophthalmologists and when they do, uh, for example, laser surgery, there's a, a million different ways they could do it that could create different outcomes, different parameters, <clears throat> and different people might do it differently. Okay, so, <clears throat> okay, so you're asking about the intermediate points. <clears throat> okay. mm -hmm. yes, I, slides on that I skipped also. Yes, so I'm talking about objective outcomes, the actual answer. To get to that point, you could imagine having multiple, you, you know, I do a pathology test, and maybe, maybe uh, every time Dr. A does it, she always gives a value which is one too high, and Dr. B gives one, one too low. But if I know it's Dr. A, I can compensate for that. I can learn that, that the intermediate results, the, I had a slide about, do I want objective values for the intermediate terms? <clears throat> and the answer is you don't need it. It's, it's desirable. Uh, again, I won't pull my slides, but I have a slide about <clears throat> one man's ceiling to the next man's floor, right? <clears throat> that if it's objective, it becomes, it becomes easier. If it's not objective, there's still ways to handle it. Uh, I, can, I can learn to compensate for the, for the things. And I can also learn 
just ignore that feature because it's so unreliable, I can't use it. <laughs> Does that get to your question? Yeah, that's great, thank you. Okay, Ali. Um, hi, Professor, thank you for the great talk. I was just wondering, is there a way we can get the machine to come up with its own action? Like, let's say for the comic book guy, none of the three diets worked out, but we told it, oh, the veggie diet has this stuff in it and the paleo diet has this stuff. Could it, in theory, make its own diet and then recommend that to us? Um, well, again, <clears throat> the model so far, the framework has been, I've got a discrete set of actions, <clears throat> probably could veggie or, you know, or vegan or paleo stuff. You can imagine, for example, having linear combinations, you know, alpha times vegan plus one minus alpha times paleo, whatever that means. <clears throat> but you can imagine conceptually that. And now you can ask a question, could I learn the parameter which does the best? <clears throat> now, if you ignore you know, confounders and so forth, you say, yes, you potentially could. You could find a new thing, which was in the, in this case, in the, um, <clears throat> linear combinations of the things you looked at, or maybe in general, right? <clears throat> the example I had A before B before C, maybe it should be B before A. <clears throat> it turns out if I know the probabilities and I make the, I make the um, uh, noisy or assumptions about the different probabilities, I can decide on other, on other things which would do better. because so there are analytic ways, and can I skip those slides also, the analytic ways to find the thing which does better than the current set of options. Can you always do it? Well, no, it depends what assumption you want to make. Sorry. No, no, that makes sense. Thank you. Great questions. These are th three wonderful questions. Here. Any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, let's thank Russ for a wonderful presentation and thank you everyone for joining in today. I hope you have Russ' email if in case you want to discuss more. Ruchka has sent a clap. Okay. And I assume everyone's going to, all doctors claim, change their clinical practice from now on, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this talk will be available on Amy's YouTube channel within a week or two. Uh, thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Graham has also clapped for you. Uh, Russ. Uh, Annette has also clapped. Thank you, uh, everyone. See you next week. Thank Stay you. safe. Stay safe. Bye for now. Ali has also. Yeah.